next speaker is uh, Herr Barlow, formerly of the Charles Herr at the Perimeter Institute. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation to speak here. So I'm definitely going to treat this as a school talk, although it still has a bit of a research title on the slides. And I think I'm also going to do most of it at the board um, in order to keep things going slowly enough that you understand everything that's, that's going on. So John gave quite a nice, John Barrett yesterday gave quite a nice um, first part of this um, set of talks on the convex operational framework for theories, or what's sometimes called the general probabilistic framework for theories. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of motivations that um, maybe he didn't stress um, so much yesterday. Um, so another possible motivation is that by understanding information processing, sort of in an abstract setting that includes quantum information processing, but is substantially broader. Um, you know, perhaps it'll actually give some insight into how quantum information processing works, even ideas for new protocols, maybe simpler proof techniques. Um, I mean, if quantum, uh, in some cases, quantum arguments have made classical complexity theory proofs easier, perhaps uh, other things are even easier in the general framework where maybe you aren't distracted by certain details. Uh, so that's another motivation for this. Um, and another point, uh, there's a question about, um, you know, is there any new physics in this? Um, and so I want to say that even if, I mean, you could view it as maybe a source for, you know, slight tweaks to quantum theory that seem to be consistent and you could test for whether they're true or not. Um, but just looking at quantum theory itself within this framework and understanding the nature of information, you might argue that perhaps that's sort of the right way to understand the essence of quantum theory, and the essence of quantum theory seems to be quite puzzling to a lot of people. Uh, and there seem also to be open questions about how to integrate it with gravitational physics. Um, and you know, it's clear that the future of physics and the position of quantum theory within it is not um, set right now. We don't know exactly how it's going to go. And so maybe understanding quantum theory from a particular point of view will change the way we might be able to create progress in the future in physics. So I'd argue that this project is worthwhile for that. Uh, from that point of view, uh, you know, even if it doesn't, uh, you know, suggest that quantum theory is you know, that we want to formulate one of these other theories as sort of better than quantum theory. It's a way of looking at quantum theory to make us understand more what it truly is. Uh, okay. So with that, I'm going to be fairly. Uh, I'm going to be fairly technical, and I'm really going to try to present the um, basic mathematics of the framework um, so that I hope to give everybody, especially the students, a um, you know, pretty good background for reading some of the papers in this area. Um, So let me give a rough overview of, um, of the framework. Um, we've got a bunch of systems, um, which we label with usually letters like A, B, and C. Each one has a convex, compact set of states. Uh, there's these affine functionals John mentioned yesterday that determine probabilities uh, given a state. Uh, and I've written them as this initial interval in an ordered linear space, which I'll describe more. There's this bilinear map from states and outcomes to probabilities. Um, well, it's given by the fact these are affine functionals on the state space. Uh, and then we have a generalization of what's called a POVN in quantum mechanics. Um, a set of these affine functionals that add up to this unit functional. And this unit functional is the one that gives one on every element of this compact convex set. Um, so I like to view these affine functionals as actually linear functionals on a bigger space. Um, so you add one dimension to the affine space that contains this base for your cone. Uh, well, it contains this compact convex set. Let's say it's a circle, this compact convex set of states. This is a mega. And you use it as a base. That's in, in a two dimensional affine space. You use it as a base for the cone. So these are your normalized states. You include zero down here. 
And then you look at all multiples of states, and that gives you what's called a cone of unnormalized states. Okay. Um, we want a convex set of dynamics that um, you know, are allowable or implementable somehow, um, either by nature or by experiment or fiddling with things and messing about with nature. Um, taking states to states, um, you know, perhaps going from one type of system to another. Uh, ways of making composite systems. Uh, and it's actually quite natural to, to make this all into a category. Let me speak about that a bit. Let me summarize the main results that um, me and my collaborators have gotten in the framework. There are other people working in this framework, so these aren't all the results in this very active research area. Um, okay, John mentioned uh, some of these yesterday. A set of states can be cloned, in other words, we make independent copies, if and only if the states are perfectly distinguishable. You can broadcast them, so we want to have, you know, two systems that have the same state, but that may be a mixed state, and these are just the marginals of that state. They could be correlated after those are broadcasted. And that's so if and only if the state is in the convex hull of a set of clonable states. So it lies in a simplex of perfectly distinguishable states in the state space. Um, okay, and there's a PRL about that in a longer paper that has uh, more detail about exactly what um, broadcastable sets of states look like. Um, okay, the only information you can obtain without disturbance is information that is intrinsically classical in the theory. Uh, that in some sense can never be superposed. It's like finding out what abelian super selection sector um, you're in, or quantum theory with uh, super selection rules. Um, okay, exponentially secure bit commitment possible in any non classical theory that does not have entanglement. Uh, and then I actually will speak more at length in this talk towards the end about necessary conditions for conclusive teleportation. That's where it always has to work with positive probability. Uh, but that probability doesn't have to be one. So it's like <laughs> post-elective uh, teleportation. Uh, and also sufficient conditions for deterministic teleportation. I don't think we really have necessary and sufficient conditions for that, uh, except for sort of mildly interesting restatements. Uh, we don't really have any deep necessary conditions, sufficient conditions that are obvious. But some interesting sufficient ones that involve the state space having a lot of symmetry. And that's going to be a theme that recurs that when the state space has a lot of symmetries, that's quite interesting. And of course, quantum state space is one of the most symmetric you can imagine. Um, oh, okay, conditions for um, what Schrodinger called uh, steering of ensembles. Uh, he thought it was kind of remarkable that if you had an entangled state, uh, by choosing what you measure over here, you could make it, um, you know, you could view it as either as a mixture um, conditional on measurement outcomes on one part of the state, you could view it as a mixture either of, say, position eigenstates or momentum eigenstates at a remote site. He called that steering. Um, so this paper, which I will talk about tomorrow morning in QPL, is a uh, study of that. We also, um, with Cosman Uderdeck, who's a really good student, who's at Waterloo, University of Waterloo, uh, and Joe Emerson, who's uh, faculty at Waterloo, we formulated Raphael Sorkin's notion of borders of interference for case-lit experiments. Um, and, and this is quite an interesting notion that I urge people to look up. Um, quantum theory has the lowest non-trivial order of interference. It's k equals 2, second order interference. Um, you see it in two-slit experiments. And basically, in quantum theory, any pattern that you see in a three-slit experiment, uh, you can analyze it as a a weighted sum of patterns uh, from the two slit sub experiments where you have to do some subtractions to uh, deal with overcounting because you know, the two slit experiments overlap. Uh, so there's no sort of irreducible third order interference. But you can imagine, you know, um, experiments that do show irreducible third order inter interference. Sorkin formulated a quantitative notion of, of this. And uh, so we've kind of ported that notion to this convex operational framework. I uh, probably won't get time to say too much more about it. Um, there's a paper on the three-slit um, version that you can look at. Uh, and then in this paper in New Journal of Physics early this year, we, um, we studied entropy and also this notion called information causality that some of you may have heard of. Um, and so by defining entropy in a particular way, 
Um, we showed that in a certain class of theories, um, basically those in which the entropy, um, the entropy of measurement outcomes satisfies um, what's called strong subadditivity, that this information causality uh, principle holds. And so a bunch of people whose initials I can remember, PPK, SWZ, um, <laughs> showed that um, Pavlovsky, and Winter, and Skarani, and various people. Anyway, they showed that if you satisfy this information causality principle, uh, the correlations you can get from the theory have to satisfy Cyrilson's bound, which is the same bound that quantum theory satisfies. Uh, and it's, weak, it's a stronger bound than you get from just no signaling. Um, and basically, we did it by showing that our notion of entropy, if it satisfied strong subadditivity, had all the other properties necessary to uh, adapt the proof that PPKSWZ showed, used to show that quantum theory satisfies their information causality principle. Um, so that's something you can look up. I probably won't also won't get to talking about that. Um, I think it's the teleportation is going to be the research result that I stress in this talk. Okay, and then there's a review that you can ask me for. I kind of lost track of the source code, so. This generalized entropy was this rainy entropy, silent entropy. Excuse me. You invented new generalization of fundamental entropy like Rainy or Salis or what? This is based on Shannon entropy. Shannon, um, so it's classical? It's based on extremizing the classical entropy of measurement outcomes over possible measurements where the measurements are fine grained, basically. So, I won't, I'll, okay, I'll tell you a little bit later after I talk about structure what a fine grained measurement is. But, but all this measurement entropy is, is it's just the, um, it should actually be the minimum over. Fine grain measurements. Measurements. Um, so E sub i are the effects of the outcomes of the, um, of the Shannon entropy of the outcome probabilities. Okay, and so this is you know S sub measurement of a state omega. <coughs> And so, of course, these E sub i have to be evaluated on the state omega. You get probabilities. You take the Shannon entropy. Uh, and you want to take the least Shannon entropy, but you want to make the measurement fine grained, so you're not allowed to do something um, you know, stupid like measure the order unit, which always has probability 1 and always has zero entropy. That would kind of be a doofy way of finding entropy. So you know, if you do this in quantum theory, you find that if you take a density matrix and you measure it, um, let's say, Let's say for now we, we, we just think about fine grained von Neumann measurements of orthogonal <laughs> projectors, but you can choose the basis, and of course the basis whose probabilities you're going to have the least entropy is going to be if you measure the eigenbasis of the density matrix, so you get von Neumann entropy. So this generalizes von Neumann entropy in that way. Uh, and if it satisfies strong subadditivity, defined in exactly the same way as you define it um, in quantum theory, except with this in place of the Shannon entropy, uh, then you can prove all the other things about this entropy that you need to, um, to make this proof of information causality go through. Uh, and thereby show that such theories will satisfy the Searles effect. So, so this is all in this article, and I, I probably don't want to go too much farther into it. But this notion of entropy is you know, a good thing to remember. And it's kind of a standard strategy for dealing with these theories. Um, is to sort of adapt the quantum strategy of, you know, just take some classical quantity, apply it to the classical outputs of a measurement, or maybe even to the classical uh, probabilities with which you mix, say, some pure states to get a state. Those are two alternatives, this preparation version and the measurement version of this entropy. And the measurement version turns out to be most interesting. Uh, but you can, you can play this game of extremizing classical quantities that are defined in terms of probabilities, you know, with all kinds of concepts like fidelities and distances. Okay, now let me get a little more into the uh, formalism. Um, okay, so I mentioned the state of space, uh, the, the space of normalized states is this convex compact set. Uh, its affine dimension is going to be one less than this ambient dimension where we have the cone of unnormalized states, and this thing serves as a base, which just means that everything in the cone is a multiple of something in here, um, and that basically it's the intersection of an affine subspace, um, affine hyperplane. Our cones are going to be, well, okay. 
our measured outcomes are going to be linear functionals, and that's basically, they're the affine functionals John talked about, but we're in one higher dimension, so we can make them linear. Um, and we call them effects, and we just look at all the linear functions whose values on states are in uh, the interval 0, 1 in the reals. Um, measurements are going to be index sets of effects that add up to this unit effect. I think I said that already. Um, and then the effects generate, in other words, they generate as a cone. If you take all non-negative well, all, all non multiples of effects, uh, you get a cone. And it's actually the dual cone, let's say A star plus, of the cone A plus of unnormalized states for the object A, uh, the system A. Okay, now sometimes we might want to restrict our measurement outcomes to a subcone of the dual cone, right? So say, even though, you know, various things, I think John talked about this yesterday as well, uh, various measurements are logically possible, we might want to restrict them uh, and say, you know, for whatever reason our theory doesn't let us do everything that's mathematically consistent. Um, however, often it's a much more mathematically natural uh, thing to take all the, um, you know, take the full dual cone uh, as the unnormalized measurements. And, it, and sometimes you can prove quite a bit more if you make that assumption. Um, and just a side note, um, so what is a cone, right? It's a, um, it's a set in a real vector space closed under multiplication by non-negative scalars. That's a positive cone. Our cones are also going to be convex, so they're closed under addition as well. Uh, and they're going to be regular, which means we take them as topologically closed, because remember, we want this slice to be compact, uh, topologically closed and pointed. So they don't contain any full subspace, except just the zero subspace, the null subspace. Uh, so they've got a point here. And that you also need to get compactness of the base. Excuse me? Misgenerating. Generate. I did, meant, did. I did too. Oh yeah, yes. Well, it's here, and it should be there. Yeah. We, we want. We want. We, know, we want them to generate this ambient vector space. As uh, right. If you take linear combinations of things in the cone. It should generate the vector space. Um, and basically, a vector space with a distinguished cone like this is uh, more or less the same thing as an ordered linear space. Um, it's where you've got. You know, the ordering is just A less than or equal to B is the same thing as B minus A is the end of the cone, your vector space. Okay. So that's the formalism. Uh, all right. Um, let me just now, this is mostly just another more formal version of the formalism, but let me just give you a little bit more of a flavor for how these things work. This is very basic, so I'll call it up to those of you who are familiar with this, but let's just take some cone in R2, right? And basically all cones in R2 are equivalent to um, positive quadrant R2 plus, but well, let's just take this one that's a little narrower. Um, okay. What does the dual cone look like? Well, it's everything that has a non-negative, well, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to represent the dual cone in this same space um, by means of an inner product, right? And an inner product is basically just an isomorphism from the dual vector space to the primal vector space um, that your original vector space you were considering that gives you um, a way of, um, well, if you take the inverse of the isomorphism, you, you, you take things out of the original vector space, turn them into linear functionals, then you can evaluate them on the base of the primal vector space and so you've got a bilinear form. Um, and if that form is positive uh, definite, then um, it's an inner product. Um, so let's say we have some inner product, and we look at what is the, what is the dual cone represented in the primal space look like. So it's everything you know, that has uh, an angle of 90 degrees or less with everything in the primal cone. So here's the dual cone for this primal cone. It's, uh, These are its two, what we call, extremal rays. Um, so you can see it's quite a bit wider than this thing, because this is 90 degrees, that's 90 degrees. Um, now, if we chose a different inner product, right, this, this might look different. We, we, we chose the Euclidean inner product that looks like, um, you know, 90 degrees on the board. Um, 
these are auto in the single product. Um, and it's sort of immaterial to the theory, right, to, to the operational content of the theory, which inner product you choose. It's just a matter of um, having a prettier, more convenient, or less convenient representation. Um, so an interesting thing about this representation is um, if we choose a different inner product, we can actually get the primal of the dual cone to coincide uh, and just to be R2 plus if we draw this um, you know, geometrically and in the right way to go with our inner product so that uh, this is, well, we can take a basis that's orthonormal with that inner product. Um, those are the unit vectors. Um, so if we choose the inner product right, we can actually get the cone and the dual cone to line up with themselves, um, to, to be equal in this case, right? And that's not at all a generic property. That's what we call self-duality. Um, so a cone is self-dual if you can get it to, um, if by choosing an inner product and representing the dual cone in the primal space, you can get it to line up. Uh, you get the two to be equal. Uh, there may be you know, other inner products you can choose where the dual according to that inner product isn't equal to the first thing. It's a matter of, does there exist one? Um, such that that's true. <coughs> A kind of fun heuristic way to think about um, a dual cone is to imagine a like a board. I mean, this works in R3, but you can get a lot of nice examples in R3. Uh, think of a board with like a pole attached, um, and then think of the intersection of the board and the pole as the origin, that kind of fix there, but you can pivot it around and you pull this thing up so that the board is um, touching the cone. And then as you roll that board around the cone, this pole that's sticking out is going to trace out the boundary of the dual cone. Uh, because you can force this 90 degree condition that um, you know, this thing is at 90 degrees or less from everything in the dual cone. Because everything in the dual cone is on, or, sorry, everything in the primal cone is on the same side of the board. So that's kind of a way of visualizing what's the dual cone in the cone. And, and so from that kind of thinking, you can, you can see things like, let's say I've got a square-based cone, right? So it looks like this. And um, again, again, this is all in a representation where I'm assuming some ambient inner product so I can look at the dual cone as being in the same space. Um, well, the dual cone just looks like this. It also has, okay, so depending on the opening angle, this might be fatter or thinner, but um, it also has a square base, but it's rotated by pi over 4. Um, so there it is. Um, and so the interesting thing to observe with this one is that it's exactly the same shape as the final cone, but it's rotated by pi over 4. So it's not equal to the primal cone. There's no Euclidean inner product you can choose that will make it equal to the primal cone. So we call this uh, sort of cone weakly self-dual. Uh, the one where you can choose your inner product so it's um, exactly on top of the primal cone, we call self-dual. Is this particular particularity of the 3D space, the MN space? Is what a particular 3D space? The fact that you can't find an inner product. Okay. You can for this particular cone. So, sorry. I mean, if you look at the four dimensions, I mean, then we'll get a plane and we'll get a cube. Um, well, it depends what cone you're talking about. Because I'm thinking of the symplectic in our product. I mean, for that, the vector is going to be orthogonal to itself. Okay, so when I say in a product, I mean a positive semi definite by the nature point. The symplectic in a product won't count. Okay. Although those, those things do come up. Right? They, that, that, could, that could be a perfectly good isomorphism between the dual space and, and the primal space if it's non degenerate. Um, but it won't be Euclidean in your product. So when I, when I talk about you know, the dual, representing the dual space and the primal space um, by an inner product, I want to Euclidean in your product, standard inner product. Um, I mean, it just so happens that all cones in two dimensions are, that are generated, that have this irregularity problem are isomorphic, uh, and they're all just the classical you know, R2 plus. You know. um, so they have, if they have all these regular um, I think one of his 
questions was if you went up the dimension instead of using a square, uh -huh. you used a cube. You used a cube. The dual, would that be what an octahedron? Yeah, it would not be so. Yeah, so it's not. Yeah. But I mean, in general, you know, even in R3, cones are not weakly self dual. So, um, you know, it, it's a very non generic property of cones in most dimensions. But yeah, just I mean, if you think of the, the faces, will correspond to the extreme points of the dual, on the base of the dual, and so they won't come. Yeah, and that, that's how you can see that it's, it's not, not yeah, the cone the cubic base is not even a weakly self. Right. So a few examples, um, well, I guess I've, I've given most of the examples, but so in quantum mechanics, what's this cone? It's the cone of posi positive semi-definite operators. The ambient vector space is just the cone of self-adjoint operators on some complex Hilbert space. We're going to be dealing with finite dimensions all the time, um, just to make things easier. Uh, and what's the order unit? Well, it's basically the trace. Um, so this functional, which I'm calling the order unit, right? that's the thing that as evaluates to one on all of your normalized states. It tells you what the normalized states are. And it's just some element of the interior of the um, dual cone. Okay. The square-based cone I already mentioned, it's worth, so unfortunately I wasn't here for Sandy's talk, but it's worth mentioning that the square bit is sort of the uh, state space of a single system of what's sometimes called box world. Right, where you look at um, um, these so-called popescu rorlich boxes, where you have um, uh, you can have stronger than quantum correlations, um, and the reason that is is because box world, so a PR bit, um, you, or, or squid, as we call it, square bit, um, you basically have two. Um, you start with two measurements. And they're sort of the extremal measurements, because you could also have fuzzy versions of them. And each with two outcomes. And there's absolutely no other restriction. Uh, so you can see that to specify a state, you just have to say, what's the probability of, let's say, out outcome 0 or 1 if I make the first measurement? And what's the probability if I make the second measurement? Um, and so the state space is just determined by two probabilities. That gives you a square. Um, and then the so-called PR boxes are states of two of these uh, squids or PR bits. Um, so that is actually this. This is the unnormalized uh, state space of those. OK, let, let me just say a few more things about the geometry of um, the geometry you get out of this kind of model of system. So an extremal state is one that is extremal in the mathematical sense in this convex body. It means you cannot write it as a non-trivial convex combination of two other states. Um, an atomic effect, and I may slip and sometimes call it extremal effect, is one that is on an extremal ray of the cone effects, and is also as far out along that ray as it can possibly be. So what, what do the effects look like? Um, Let's just draw a two-dimensional classical theory. Here's the cone. It's everything in here, all pairs of positive numbers. Here's the um, base for the final cone. Um, it's just uh, the probability simplex. It's specified by a single probability, and the other probability is 1 minus p. Um, one, two outcome measurement. And here, if, if we use the Euclidean inner product, uh, standard Euclidean inner product, and uh, represent the dual cone and the final cone in the same space, here's the vector 1, 1, and that's the order unit. Um, right? That just, if you take its dot product with a probability uh, vector, it just adds up the probabilities and gives you 1. Um, and now, what is this interval? 0, u, a, in the order, um, which I said was the legitimate effects. Well, 
it's just this whole square. Um, so here's its extremal points. Um, and these guys are actually the atomic effects. So effects is the word we give to these affine functionals. Um, and you know, this one is basically the out, you know, one of the outcomes, and this is the other of the outcomes, and it's represented by you know, 0, 1. If we do this for three-dimensional classical theory, the effects form actually a cube. Um, and there's one point I want to make about this, which is that here's 0, 0, 0. Here's the order unit 1, 1, 1. This is a convex body. Uh, its extremal points are, of course, uh, maybe this is 1, 0, 0. Uh, maybe it's 0, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1. Uh, but also, besides zero in the order unit, we have um, this one is maybe one one zero, and so forth. There's three other extremal points, and these are extremal in this interval. You know that they're this is a convex set. Uh, all these vertices are extremal points, and these are extremal in this interval. But they're not atomic. The atomic ones are the ones that are on extremal rays of the cone. Um, which are these. Uh, so these are the atomic effects. Um, okay. What is an extremal ray of the cone, by the way? Um, so let's say R is an extremal ray. if um, no element of R can be um, written as a convex combination So we, we think of slicing a cone and getting a base for it. Uh, the extremal points of that base are just representatives of the extremal rays. Um, and the point is that these things, even though they're extremal in this type of effects, they're not on extremal rays of the cone. They're interior. Um, so the extremal effects actually form a lattice. This isn't maybe so important to know. And the atomic ones are the atoms in that lattice. So you get this guy by adding these guys. And there's an ordering, and it gives you a lattice. So that's probably the reason for atomic there. Okay, and now we can actually come back to this definition of entropy. I think the proper way to define the measurement entropy is to require, um, well, you could consider requiring defining fine grained as meaning that the measurement outcomes are atomic, or perhaps better, is just to require them to be on extremal rays. Uh, and that's, that's clearly fine grained. If they're on extremal rays, you can't write them as a non trivial, you can't decompose them non trivially as a sum of other effects. So they really are fine grained. You can decompose them as a sum of multiples of themselves, but that's obviously sort of silly. And it certainly won't help you minimize this because it just generates entropy. Um, okay, so you know, that's why concepts like extremal ray, atomic effect are useful. One example. Okay, let's define a face of a cone, because that's an important um, concept. Um, so is this concrete enough? I mean, maybe I should give another example, right? The state space of a qubit. Um, is just a ball. That's the compact convex set. And I can't really draw the cone because the cone has to go into four dimensions. But in a lot of ways, it behaves like this, this circle, circular-based cone, which is the state space of a real qubit, if you like, a qubit where you can only take, at the Hilbert space level, real linear combinations. Uh, so it's in a real Hilbert space. 
Uh, and in fact, you can ask, you know, what does, what, what does the effect space look like for that? Well, it actually looks like this. Just that. I mean, the reason you get this kind of geometry is that this interval between zero and the unit is just telling you that the stuff has to be bigger than zero, so you, it has to be in the cone, and it has to be less than the unit. And that means it has to be in the upside down cone with its point shifted to be at the unit. So you intersect those two things and you can see what the effect space looks like. And that's how you get this cube as well for the classical case. So that's a little more of kind of the geometry that you can visualize. Um, Is there a like, general characterization of what quantum state spaces look like? A general characterization of what quantum state spaces look like? I mean, and spins. not really beyond, uh, not so much beyond you know, saying that they look like, uh, you know, the density matrices. There are cones of the density matrix space. There are cones of positive semi-definite matrices. Um, you know, but we knew all that already. Geometrically, there's not, as far as I know, something really simple you can say. I mean, you may be able to talk about them maybe as some kind of manifold that is, um, you know, some kind of product of simplex and some group. But the ball picture is quite misleading for a general quantum. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, so if you, if you, you can, obviously the, the free, the Q-trip state space has a section which looks like a triangle. So it's kind of pointy you know, in, in some ways, but very round in others. So it's, it has, actually Mauro had some films of sections going through the state space. These look pretty funny. But it's, um, I don't think there's a good direct geometric relationship. Yeah. I mean, you can also consider systems that have higher dimensional balls as their state space, and they have such properties as there are any a set of perfectly distinguishable states um, contains at most two states. Um, because basically you can think of, um, well, the, the states of the antipodes of the ball will be perfectly distinguishable, and you can't add any more to get a set, whereas a d-dimensional, in quantum theory on d-dimensional Hilbert space, there's d distinguishable points. Um, so you know this thing, that uh, quantum theory stops being a ball after d equals 3, yes, d equals uh, 2. Isn't there, in Ludwig's world, not something like capitalization of... No, no, but I, 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 I understood this question as a visualization question. Of course, characterization of the state space there are is the whole point of this enterprise. And of course, also Ludwig, so Austin Schultz, and all these people. So, of course. So, let me say a little more in general about convex geometry, since, again, since it's a school. Um, so, the notion of a face is important, and a face in a convex set. It's just a set that's um, closed under inclusion of things that can appear in convex decompositions of elements of the face. So what do I mean by this? I mean, for instance, that um, uh, well, let's take this square. Um, so here's a face, right? If I take a point in here, uh, I look at all the convex decompositions of this as sums, convex weighted sums of other things in the cone, um, they're all in this face already. And that's true for anything in here. So that's the face. Um, if, again, I look at this square and I say, well, let me see. I have three extremal points. I wonder if it's always the case that the convex hull of some extremal points is a face. Is this a face? Well, no. I could take this point and I could make it as a convex combination of those two. So these guys all have to be in the face. So, the 
whole thing is a face, but this slice, this, this chunk, is not. Um, and then we can define the face generated by a set of things, or by a thing in the cone, as the smallest face that contains it. So for example, if I said cone, this, the notion applies to any convex set. So again, if we have our squares, our convex set, I take, say, this central point, um, the face it generates is the entire cone. Now, frequently, faces are what's called exposed, and that means they are the intersection of a supporting hyperplane with the cone. So you take a hyperplane, right, that's a, an affine plane that has dimension one less than the n bun space, and you push it up against the cone or the convex set till it's just touching, and um, that intersection will be a face, called an exposed face. But not all faces are exposed, which is sort of a technical point, but one to be aware of. The standard example is I have something that's got straight sides, I hook it up with some semicircles, and these points aren't exposed. Because when you try to tilt this line around, pick out this point, as soon as you intersect with it, you intersect with this whole side. Um, okay, so if you ever encounter the distinction between exposed faces and faces, that's pretty much what it is. Again, I'm talking about finite dimensions. There's slight, slightly more sophisticated stuff in the dimensions. Um, could you, is there a case where the, the uh, generated face is something besides a single face or the whole set? Yes. Well, what do you mean by a single face? I mean, of course, the generated face is always a single face, but there's certainly no. cases where it's not um, two dimensional, for example. Right. I, mean, I mean, so if you take a cube, um, well, you can see the faces are, the, every vertex is a face, every edge is a face, every, what you normally call face is a face, mm -hmm. one of those squares, and the whole thing is a face. Um, and so there is actually what's called a lattice of faces. If you take any two faces, and you take the face that they generate, the smallest face that contains them both, that's called the join. Yeah, the join of the faces. And if you just take their intersection, you can prove that's also a face, and that is called the meet of the faces. And the join and meet actually satisfy the axioms for a lattice. So there's a face lattice, which was another point I wanted to make. Um, and actually, if you look at the lattice of faces of the dual cone, I think it's just the upside down lattice of faces of the private cone. So that's another thing to remember that can come in handy. And so in particular, the um, maximal faces of the dual cone are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the extremal rays of the primal cone. Uh, or, yeah. So I, I tend to switch back and forth between cones and bases and, and, com and convex sets, where the convex set is a base for the cone. Uh, but pretty much you know, anything you can say in one kind of terminology, you can translate to the other. The notion of direct sum of cones is important. Um, so we'll say a cone is a direct sum of cones C sub i. Every element in the cone is a convex combination of elements of the C sub i. Um, so there's no extremal points of the cone that are, you, you can break down the ambient subspace into subspaces where these different things live, uh, these, these different components live. And there's no extremal rays that are not in those particular subspaces, or if it's continent, yes. Uh, so the way of thinking of this is that there's no coherent superposition of elements of the different um, components of a direct sum. There's only mixture of those things. So it's a way of having intrinsically classical information in your code. And it's related to all, some of these structures that the category theorists have been denoting by a plus. Of course, every finite dimensional cone is, in a unique way, a finite direct sum of these components. And you can think of a simplex as a direct sum of copies of the one-dimensional cone. So that's what a finite dimensional classical is. Okay. So when John mentioned yesterday that you can only, uh, that there's an information disturbance relation 
um, in these convex theories. Um, what this really means is that the only information you can get without disturbance is information about which direct sum and um, a state is in. And I think I'm not going to go into a lot of more detail about that. Um, okay, so more basics. Um, how are we going to represent dynamics in our theories? We've talked about states and measurement outcomes. Um, so dynamics are going to be represented by linear maps that take the cone of unnormalized states into itself. Um, okay, and this is what's called a positive map. Uh, or more generally, if, if, you have, if you're going from one, one space to another, the space of another system, uh, you take this cone's state space, uh, its positive states, into um, the other system's allowed states. Um, Okay, and in general, we'd be concerned with sort of physically reasonable ones that take normalized states to normalized states, or maybe, so states in the base to states in the base of the other cone, or maybe they take them below the base of the other cone. But we don't want them going above the base, because then if you evaluate one of these effects on them, you'll get numbers that are, in some cases, greater than one, and you won't have a probability interpretation. Uh, but nevertheless, it's mathematically useful to just consider, at times, all positive maps. Uh, and ask things about them, just as it's useful to consider the entire cone of states. So we say a positive map is an order isomorphism. Uh, if it also, besides uh, taking this into that, takes it onto that, in fact. Um, and so equivalently, it's invertible and it's inverse is positive. And we call it an automorphism if it's an isomorphism from the cone to itself. Um, and not surprisingly, the automorphisms of a cone form a group. Uh, and inverses associated with. Um, okay, a theorem that actually Alex and I and, and the student proved in our paper that was out last year in Quant PH, but I think it's pretty likely to be known by various people, uh, is that if you look at the cone, it is a cone, of positive maps from one ordered linear space to another, um, the isomorphisms are extremal in that cone. Um, it's not too hard to see. But it's kind of important. So that's a good thing to remember. Um, for each base of the cone, so for each thing you might want to be considering is the normalized states of your theory, um, there's a subgroup, which is the automorphisms of that base. It's a subgroup of the automorphisms of the whole cone. And it just consists of the base-preserving transformations, sometimes called reversible transformations. Uh, it's a maximal sub compact subgroup of this automorphism group of the whole cone, which of course isn't compact because you can always multiply things by arbitrarily large numbers and stay on the cone. Uh, okay, so this is an interesting and important subgroup, right? In quantum theory, you take density matrices, you take the group that acts, you take the group generated by, uh, you know, conjugating the density matrix by unitaries, and that is. Um, Oh, is that the whole automorphism group? Uh, sorry, the whole automorphism group of the of the uh, normalized state space. I believe it's actually not quite. Um, excuse me. You, you can take the transpose for one. Yeah, that's mean to say that it's So yeah, the anti-unitaries show up as linear map on this mixed state space, but they're maps that involve the transpose. So let me just tell you what the extremal rays of this cone are in the quantum case. They are the maps x goes to ax a dagger, where a is non-singular. Um, and they're also maps x goes to a x transpose a dagger, where again a is non-singular. We don't allow the transpose because it's not completely positive if we want physically reasonable maps. But the whole automorphism group does include this stuff. Um, of course, only this stuff is in the connected identity component, which is often the most interesting part. Um, and so interestingly, um, you know, the CP maps in quantum mechanics are just um, sums and also limits of sums of um, maps in the automorphism group in the connected identity component of the automorphism group. Um, 
So that's maybe a slightly, a, a bit of a concrete example. Um, okay, so we'll call it dynamics for an operational model. So if our operational model is specified by a, um, an ordered linear space and an ordered unit that picks out the normalized states, but we're assuming that we have all the effects, uh, a full dual cone. Uh, it's just some cone of positive maps on that system that's closed under composition and contains the identity. Uh, and the isomorphisms will be extremal in any such cone as well, not just in the full cone of all positive maps. But they'll remain extremal if you have it. Yes? Can I mention you can also the unpaired unitaries from Wigner's theorem is what you're saying if you extend these in one way or another to a larger system, you lose positivity? Yes. Oh, okay. That's, that's why, well... You take an anti-unitary and you extend it, then usually the argument against those is continuity or something like that. So no, they no, are it's the action of the GP positive. Oh, okay, okay. It's, it's just the transpose is, a, is, a, uh, is what you get from just the complex conjugation as well. And of course, there are other maps that aren't completely positive that are not, you know, in the cone generated by automorphisms. And they're also bad. Because they're not completely positive. Um, I think we've talked about restricted measurements. Um, okay, sometimes we call, um, yeah, we're most interested in physical maps, as I said, that can, um, can decrease the normalization, but, but not increase it. Uh, and often these are viewed as associated with some process that happens with probability, and the order unit applied to the output state tells you what that probability is. Um, of course, the dual version of this is just to say that the adjoint of this map takes the unit uh, below itself. Uh, and so a dual statement of reversibility, which we'll use in a bit, is that uh, the dual map preserves the order unit. Um, Okay, some people call a set of norm non increasing maps that sum to a norm preserving one an instrument. In particular, I think I've seen that term in some of Vallejo's papers. Um, so that's like a complete set of processes uh, such that one of them's got to happen. Um, Davis, Brian Davis started that. I'm sorry, the term instrument. That, that, that's probably so. Okay, and of course there's continuously indexed analogs, which we won't talk too much about. Um, oh, and of course you can get effects from these things. If you have a subnormalized map like this, a norm decreasing map, uh, just follow it with the order unit, and that's the effect associated with that map. Um, although not uniquely, there may be many other maps associated that give you that same effect. I think I will skip the discussion of categories. I perhaps should mention that this order unit defines what's called a base norm on A and an order unit norm on, that should be a dual, uh, well, it's A sharp for a reason that I'm going to now, but I think it's A dual. Um, so this makes them both Bonnock spaces. These norms are, um, make them into Bonnock spaces. Um, Okay, and the reason I say the norms are bounded above by each other's dual norms is okay. I was thinking of an order unit norm that is generated by possibly a proper subcone here. That's what this A sharp is about. Um, if, if this were the full dual cone, then, then they would actually be dual norms. Um, and I guess, so, so I just wanted to mention that and, and, and to say that when we talk about norm decreasing maps and so forth, this actually is a genuine norm. And so it's not really an abusive terminology. Um, it agrees with this linear functional on the positive cone, uh, but not off of it. And in fact, you define these things by saying the unit ball of the base norm is, um, so if you really go into the literature, you are likely to encounter these things. Um, the unit ball of the um, of base norm for a base omega is um, convex hull of omega and minus omega. Okay, and the unit ball of the order unit norm is minus the order unit and the order unit, where this is this is the interval, right? 
So this interval is actually isomorphic to the interval of effects as a convex set. It's just a stretched out version that ends at minus u and u instead of zero and u. Um, so this is these are actually the two unit balls of these um, dual norms. Um, and if, if we have this theory where we restricted the measurements, then they're not quite dual norms. could, if we wanted, think about categories of contractive positive maps, and I think I'll skip this stuff that's aimed towards categories. Okay. Um, an important result about cones um, is one, it's one of two very nice characterizations that I know of, of the state spaces of so-called formerly real Jordan algebras. Um, and what those what that class of state spaces is, the finite dimensional formerly real Jordan algebra state spaces. Uh, more concretely, a theorem by Jordan von Neumann and Wigner, from maybe the 30s even, is um, they're just a set of n by n positive semi definite real matrices, complex matrices, or quaternionic matrices. And in each case, there's an ambient vector space of quote unquote permission matrices that you generate. Um, so that's kind of like real complex or quaternionic quantum theory. Or it's a ball, not necessarily a three ball, a ball on arbitrary dimensions, so-called Lorentz cone. Um, or it's the set of three by three. Um, I could say I left out the trace one condition here. But three by three, trace one, and this should say positive semi-definite matrices over the octonion. So this one weird exceptional case. So the point is, these state spaces are very close to quantum mechanics. I mean, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a class that has infinite families that are not exactly our normal quantum mechanics, but but it's quite restricted relative to this um, huge space of possible convex state spaces. Um, and what's the characterization? Well, of course, we're going to suppose that this is an irreducible state space because if it's not, it's just a direct sum of irreducible ones. So it's really not of much interest to, you know, I mean, the class, the, a characterization theorem may as well just concern itself with the irreducible components. Um, so if we have an irreducible, finite dimensional, strongly self dual state space, and it's what's called homogeneous, which means that it's a group of automorphisms of the whole cone, these aren't just the base preserving automorphisms, obviously. Uh, acts transitively on the interior of the cone, then it's affinely isomorphic to one of these Jordan algebra state spaces. So this probably doesn't sound like the most operational or information theoretic um, characterization, but it's sort of a good goal um, to try to find information theoretic or operational axioms that can get you to properties like homogeneity, um, or strong self-duality. In fact, tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll explain the connection between Schrodinger's notion of steering and homogeneity. Um, self-duality, we don't really have quite as much of a handle on yet, uh, but maybe John will illuminate that some when he talks about duality. Um, I mean, it, at least weak self-duality does tend to pop out from other natural considerations that actually that relates to Ross's talk, QPL, a bit. Uh, Considerations of all teleportation. Okay. Anyway, this is a very important classic theorem. Um, the other main characterization of this same class of state spaces, and actually of infinite dimensional analogs, is Alfstein and Schultz's um, characterization, and that's in terms of spectrality, which is um, basically having a nice spectral theory similar to the spectral theory of um, uh, operators of quantum theory. And they have to make some, some other assumptions. But um, there's a beautiful pair of books. Actually, the one that has the characterization is called Geometry of State Spaces of Operator Algebras. It's one of these green Berkhauser books. And it's really nice um, from like the early 2000s, although I think the work is maybe from the 70s or so. Um, but that book is beautiful. And then it sort of has a prequel, which provides some of the background on um, C-star algebras and things like that. Um, 
So this and the Alpha St. Schultz characterization, I think, are, are two really nice things to look at if you're interested in this whole kind of project of um, convex, you know, characterizing quantum mechanics as a convex theory. You, you can still ask about you know, what gets you from this broader class of things down to complex quantum theory. Of course, there's a lot of interesting questions there. Um, and you still need to perhaps provide alternative, you know, more operational motivations for these axioms. They're mathematically extremely natural, but um, there's more to do. Okay, I've described weak self-duality. I'll talk a little bit about composite systems. So John talked about composite systems a bit. Um, so let's say we have a operation, convex operational model. Remember, it's specified by an ordered linear space, uh, by the dual space ordered by a cone that's maybe a little smaller, and by an order unit that's the interior of this cone of effects. Now, we're going to call that a convex operational model. And now, a composite of such models, maybe one through n such models, um, is another operational model that has this property. It contains the tensor product as a subspace. Uh, it contains the tensor product of the vector spaces that these models live in. Um, so that's injected in there in some canonical way. And all the product states are in its cone, its positive cone. And similarly, all the product effects are in its effect cone. And we equip it with the order unit as just the tensor product of the order units. Um, now this might not be the absolutely most general thing you can think of. Um, but it should do for now. Okay, then we call it locally tomographic if actually the ambient vector space of the composite is the tensor product of these vector spaces, right? In that case, um, you can do local tomography. Everybody can measure an informationally complete observable, an information, uh, that is an observable whose outcomes span the vector space where the effects live, so that once they've estimated the probability well enough, they've got a pretty good estimate of the components of the state. Everybody does that, uh, but actually, they do the measurements um, you know, on multiple copies of the state. That's what tomography is about. But for each copy, they get to classically communicate their results. Uh, and the point is now, since the tensor products of the basis elements or, or of spanning elements are a spanning set, they can determine the state by, by estimating their correlations. I mean, they can estimate the state. So that's locally tomographic. But it's not totally unreasonable to imagine that there are theories that don't have this property where you get some systems together and there's some global degrees of freedom that are kind of attached to them but not localized at any one of them um, that you might be able to get hold of if you could somehow um, you know, do some entangling evolution on the whole system. Um, and in particular, if you want to take two, um, two state spaces of real quantum theory, so real density matrices, and have a nice composite of them, which you hope is going to be, um, so if one is m-dimensional real Hilbert space and one has n-dimensional real Hilbert space, you might hope to look at the density matrices on m n-dimensional real Hilbert space, just the density matrices on the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces. If you want to do that, that's a perfectly fine composite but it's not locally tomographic. So there are actually some fairly concrete reasons for possibly wanting to go beyond this property. So we don't require it, but it's an interesting property. And I guess we're going to call a composite regular if it's closed under conditioning. So that basically means if I take any you know, partitioning of these into subsystems, um, and I look at like all the states I can get by conditioning on one of these elements of the partition, all the states of the other stuff, um, Well, let's say I condition on everything but one thing, and I look at the states I can get, and call, call that, um, you know, look at that state space. If the whole thing is still a composite of those state spaces, we call it regular. So that's sort of a technical condition that you actually need it if you want one of these composites to, um, um, if you want to be able to model it in terms of building it up by an associative product, uh, associative two-part product. Which you might need if you're going directional. Uh, uh, yeah. um, all right. So.
John spoke a bit about um, yeah, minimal and maximal tensor products, so I won't cover that again. Um, let me just talk quickly about um, conclusive teleportation. Um, in order to do that, I should talk about remote evaluation. Okay, so if we have a bipartite state, let's say in this maximal tensor product, uh, but just you know any state that's positive when you evaluate on a product effects, um, you condition on the occurrence of an effect F in A star, and you can define the conditional state by just saying uh, it's the state on B that you get by sticking F in here and leaving this slot open to put G in. Uh, and so you have a map from effects here to states on this uh, system. Um, and so we have a way of turning bipartite states on two systems into maps from the dual of one system to the other. And in quantum mechanics, it's Troy Janikowski, and the dual of the system is the system, so you can view them as maps from the system to the other system. Uh, but here we have to keep that dual in mind. Um, okay, and now, you know, if we have three systems, A, B, C, and we've got an effect, let's say, on A, B, and a bipartite state that we've already prepared on B, C, and we get this effect as a measurement result when this is prepared in B, C, um, and maybe we have something going into A. What does C look like afterwards? I mean, we knew it was part of this bipartite state before. What does it look like afterwards? It just gets sent through the effect map and then the state map. And that is basically like teleportation, except that we don't know that we can reverse this process. But if we have a state and effect that allow us to reverse this process, um, that's teleportation. I mean, if we know what the state and effect are, we at least know what this map is. Um, but if it's a physically reversible map, um, then we've actually got conclusive teleportation. We can do some correction that gives us the original state back. Um, so a theorem characterizing when this is possible is um, this, this, this middle system has to have a subcone. Um, well, all right, the way it's stated here, we don't mention the subcone. Um, but basically, we have to be able to embed A's state cone in the effect cone of B uh, in such a way that the place we embed it, there's actually a positive item potent that has that as its range. Um, and this business of a, sub, of, of a sub cone that's the range of a positive item potent, that's kind of a place where you can stick information and hope to get it back out. So we're basically saying that when you teleport through a system B, there has to be a place in B's effect cone that's isomorphic to the state space. And furthermore, it's embedded there in, such, in, in the kind of way that you can get the information back out of it. And that's exactly what happens in the teleportation. You can think of the information going through the dual cone of the intermediate system and then back into the primal cone of the destination system. Uh, OK, deterministic teleportation. Um, you want to have an observable worth of these effects um, and a fixed state such that for each one of the effect outcomes you might get, um, the thing is conclusively teleported. You can reverse it. And these, um, these bipartite effects on A tensor B actually add up to the identity. So I'll just state, I was going to prove it, but I'll just state the, some sufficient conditions. Um, for this to be possible. So let's suppose that um, the automorphism group acts transitively on the pure states of the system. Uh, I mean, this says G is some finite group, but it's going to have to be a subgroup of the automorphism group. Um, so, so this action should be bilinear maps. Um, so it acts transitively on the pure normalized states. In other words, it can take any one to any other one uh, if you pick the right group element. Uh, and furthermore, let's say we have a bipartite state that's equivariant under that action. What does that mean? Um, I think the best way to say what it means is not really this. If you look, yeah, I think it's actually going to mean this, that omega of g and g is actually omega. 
campus in the state. Um, if you turn it into a map, it means that that map, when conjugated by G, is um, unchanged. Uh, okay, so in other words, we've got a lot of symmetry, and we have this state that's also symmetric under the action of the group uh, in a certain way. And now, um, so what we basically do is we take this state and we consider the set of, uh, we should really take an effect. Um, we should consider the, um, so we probably need an equivariant now. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, we want this state to be the G equivariant state. That's the state we use in the teleportation protocol. Um, we need the isomorphism of, let's say, the dual of the system that we're teleporting through to the primal system. And then we want to take some isomorphism that, since we said we had to have this, we want to have some effect that, um, whose corresponding map is that isomorphism. And we want to consider it, um, all the other effects that have it, but with a different group element acting before, you know, acting on the, uh, the state before you um, apply the effect. So we call these f hats of g and some normalization. Um, and the point is these make up the bipartite Bell-like measurement that will allow you to determine some computation. So that's in a paper that is, well, it's referenced below. So if you find that more interesting, I usually look up there and with that. It's not something I, it is something that people 